Beloved in the Lord, may God's grace, mercy, and peace rest upon you now and always. Amen. There are questions in life that just cannot be answered. Questions that we wrestle with day in and day out, and no matter how hard we try to answer them, we just can't. These are the questions that we wrestle with at night. That is, a, we wake up, and as we think about them, the clock ticks, and we can hear that clock ticking, but we can't get back to sleep because these questions plague our minds and plague our hearts. These are the questions that long after other things we've forgotten years and years ago, these things are indelibly imprinted in our minds, wondering, asking those questions, asking that one in particular question of why. That question of why is an age-old question. It's a question that from the beginning of time that people have been asking, well, almost the beginning of time, uh, let's say after Adam and Eve forward. That question of why, that wondering. Today, as we went into our epistle, we had Paul. Well, he didn't ask that question in the text. We know that it was on his heart. That question of why was something that struck him. Because he wondered why. Why, Lord, have you plagued me with this thorn in my side? Three times now he begged the Lord to remove that thorn. To remove that messenger of Satan, as the text tells us. But God didn't. And we see that he must have wondered why. God's answer, though, was not an answer to that why. God didn't say, this is exactly why I've done it, Paul, so hopefully you can get over it. God gave him a different answer. Instead, he said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Not a direct answer, is it? Sometimes we want those direct answers. I imagine Paul would have really appreciated that. Sometimes we ourselves want to hear God just tell us exactly why we bear the burdens we do, why we walk the road we do. But he doesn't answer us that way, does he? He doesn't just give us a manual on life and drop it into our laps and say, well, turn to page 32 when it gets to this difficult occasion. Instead, he he leads us through the various times of our life. He leads us through those struggles. But sometimes we struggle. We struggle with that promise that my grace is sufficient for you. We struggle with God's word to us that he will lead us through. And we ask those questions, why? Ultimately stemming from that original question, why? Why is there evil in this world? Why is there sin in this world? Why is there death in this world? Just yesterday, I rushed to the hospital to meet a brother pastor because he and his wife were rushing to the hospital after their son, after a week-long vacation in San Diego, was coming down the grade. And as they came down the grade, he and his friend lost control of their truck. And the truck rolled, and it rolled, and it rolled, and it rolled, as you know it would, 75 or 100 feet down the hill. And while those words of why never were spoken out loud, we were asking that question of why. We were wondering why this young man who's barely, barely lived his life yet, this young man who's under the age of 30 years old, who, why? Why did he get in this accident? Why did he experience this painful trial? Of course, all the questions that follow after that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Because sadly, not one of us can say we've lived life without asking that why question. As we've walked the paths we've had, we've, we've wondered those why questions ourselves. We've asked them of God, and we begged God for the, for the answers. But he doesn't give us the answer we want. He doesn't always give us the answer that we think we need to hear. And so we've made up answers throughout the years. People in the church have tried to say, well, Maybe we can answer the question. If God isn't going to give us that answer of why, maybe we should answer the question. Maybe we need to justify God. Because how many of us have heard that question, not just in church, but that question outside the church as well? Why? If your God is so good, if your God is so great, so mighty, so perfect and holy, why is there evil in this world? Why is there pain and death in this world? If God is so great, why? And so people have sought to answer that question. They've sought to to give a reason why. One one answer that people have offered is, well, perhaps it's that God allowed it. Perhaps it's that God allowed evil to enter into the world just so that we would have a choice. You've heard this before, haven't you? It sounds pretty good even. Well, if we have a choice, then we aren't robots, so we, we we cannot choose God if we don't want to. But there's several problems with this reasoning. There's several problems when we try to answer this way. Because when we say that God allowed sin, we suggest something that is very, 
that is contrary to God's very nature. When we suggest that God allowed sin to enter into this world, when we suggest that God allowed evil to enter this world, we're saying that our God is imperfect, that our God was not holy, righteous, just. And that's very contrary. And not only does that affect our understanding of who God is, but it also affects our salvation. Because if God is not holy, just, and perfect, if God is not righteous, then how on earth could He, or in heaven, have taken our place on the cross? How could He have gone to the cross for our sins if He was imperfect in any way, shape, or form? But not only that, it's contrary to what Scripture says. Paul says just a little bit earlier than our epistle today, God made Him, that is Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ, true God and true man, 100% God, 100% man, took our place. He took our place because there had to be a perfect sacrifice. There had to be a perfect offering before God to, take, uh, to pay for our sinfulness, our imperfections. And Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. He is that perfect offering, and He ever will be the one who takes our place. And so God can't be imperfect. We can't say that He allowed sin at the creation. Because as much as we'd like to make an excuse in that way, it takes apart our view of God down to the very fabric. Other answers have been given to answer this evil in this world. And if God is not allowing it, then perhaps He's not strong enough to stop it. Perhaps He's not able to stop it. Perhaps He has had to let it pass. Hopefully that one right there just smash you right upside the head because that one is one that is it's completely contrary to God's will. Throughout Scripture, we confess an almighty God. We confess a God who is perfect in every way. We conf- confess a God who is omnipotent, all-powerful, almighty. In fact, as we think about that all-powerful and almighty God, we realize that there is nothing that He did not create. There is nothing that is outside of His power and outside of His might. John confesses in Revelation, Alleluia, for our Lord, all God Almighty reigns. And he uses a word there, Almighty, Pantocrator. I love this word, Pantocrator. It's actually two Greek words. It's pas and kratos. And this word pas means all, every, even the tiniest little bit. And kratos, strength, power, and might. And when you put those two words together, Pantocrator, God is all-powerful, almighty. He is everything is under His command. When you think about it, there are times when we ask and we say, we look around the world and we say, how can that be the creation of our God? Roaches, mosquitoes. But everything is in God's creative hand. Everything God has created, and therefore everything is under His command. And this is good news for us. Because if it weren't, then our salvation would again be in jeopardy. Because if God were not almighty, He would not have the power to defeat death. He would not have the power to defeat the devil. And He would not have the power to defeat sin in our lives. He would not have the power to overcome death and rise from the grave. And He would not have the power to give us resurrection. But our God is. He is the Pantocrator. He is the almighty. He is the one and only. He is the first and the last. And while it's easy to defeat these answers to that why question, the truth is I still don't have an answer. I can't stand here and give you a why answer. And any pastor who does is not being honest with themselves. Because, well, we may seek to answer and say, well, there is sin in this world because Adam and Eve first sinned. Where did that sin come from? We don't know. It's not given to us in Scripture. And so when we take that step, when we try to answer for God, then we fail. We fail to completely represent God for who He is. We fail to see God for the power, for His holiness, for the parts of Him we don't understand. And so when we look at God, rather than asking the why question, we need to look and see a God who instead says not, doesn't answer that, But it says, my grace is sufficient for you. And what does it mean to say that God's grace is sufficient for you and for me? That means that as we walk those trials of this life, that as we go through the burdens that we bear, 
that our God walks with us. When you get that, that uh, medical diagnosis that confirms the sickness or disease in your body, your Lord is with you. When you lose your money, when you lose your house, when you lose your property, your God is with you. When you lose your loved one that you care about, your spouse, your God is with you. When you lose a child, when you suffer, your God is with you. For His grace is sufficient for you. And while we don't understand that completely on this side of eternity, we do have the promise that His grace is more than we could ever need or ever want. That even though as Christian people we will ask those why questions, we will come before God on our knees begging Him for answers. And even knowing that He will not say right then and there that answer to the why, that He will walk with us. In fact, he gives us a promise that as he walks with us, he gives us a promise that Paul records in Romans 8, and perhaps it's one that you have written down and underlined and highlighted in your Bibles. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. See, God didn't just leave us here to face the world as it may come. God didn't just leave us here to struggle and to wrestle with the pains of this life on our own. But he has given us a promise that he will be there and that he will work those things in our lives that we see as bad to his good. That he will work those things, those harms, those pains, those deaths in our lives to his good, to his glory, to our good, to our glory. So even as we walk those ways, even as we bear those burdens, perhaps the questions we should not be asking is why, but how? How, God, will you change this in my life? How will you shape me and form me by this? Lord, how will you use me? Paul didn't give up, even though he had begged God three times to take away his thorns. Paul didn't say, well, God, I forget it. But instead he said, he accepted God's answer. My grace is sufficient for you. And he went out and he continued to preach the gospel. He went out and he continued to share his faith. And sometimes those things in our lives, those things that God shapes us by, those are the things that he is leading us that we may trust in him more. Have you ever noticed how much our faith grows in those trials? Have you ever noticed how much your prayer life grows when you bear those burdens, when you go through those afflictions? God uses these times in our lives for His good, for His glory. He uses those times in our lives to draw us closer to Him, so that we might trust Him more. And sometimes these pains, they leave us raw. And they leave us angry. Have you ever asked that question, why, and been angry at God? You don't have to answer out loud. I will for you. I have. I've been angry at God before, and I've asked Him why. And I've asked him and I've wanted an answer and he's not given me the answer I wanted. But then looking back, he showed me why. He showed me how where his grace was leading me through. He showed me where his strength was sufficient for me. He showed me that I was a son. His son. And he shows each of us that we are his sons and daughters. That even as we bear these burdens and pains in our lives, even as we walk these these roads, that He carries us through. His grace is sufficient for you. And while our lives may not look different on this side of eternity, we do have a difference because we have hope. We have the hope that while this life is painful and difficult, that our Lord has prepared a place for us. We have the hope that because Jesus did indeed die on the cross for us, that our God in heaven has prepared a place for us with him. And we have a hope, an assurance, that one day we will be with him forever. Forever with him in paradise. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we, your children, come before you with question after question of why. We lay awake with these questions of why. We wrestle with these questions long after. Long after others have forgotten. Lead us to trust you. 
Lead us to be confident in your love for us and lead us to bring all that we bear before you. Help us to see that you are our Pantocrat, our Pantocrator, that you are the Almighty, that you are the one who have given, has given your life for us, that you have taken your place. Lead us, Lord, to know that all that we bear in this life, that your grace is sufficient for us. Your grace is sufficient for us and your power your power is made perfect in our weakness. So, Lord, as we are weak in this life, help us to continue to be weak, to know that your power may be made perfect. Lord, help us to trust and to know that all things work to the good of those who love you. Help us to trust and know that even in the worst situations of our life, you will work good out of them. And, Lord, may your peace be upon us. May your peace, which the world cannot offer, May your peace, which transcends all understanding, now guard our hearts and minds. Amen.